Hello students, today we shall be discussing two small but very important schools of painting, Barbija School of Art and the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. By the end of this module, you would have look at the two periods in the art history, Barbija and Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Understand their stylistic and thematic features. Look at some artworks and analyze them through certain perspectives. The components of this module are Barbija School 1830 to 1870, the place, plein air techniques, the artist, pre raphaelite Brotherhood, William Holman Hunt, the light of the world 1851 to 1853, Mille, Christ in the house of his parents, the carpenter's shop, 1849 to 1850. Mille Ophelia, 1851 to 52. Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the blue bower, 8865. Henry Wallace Chatterton, 1855 to 56. Ford Maddox Brown, an English autumn afternoon, Hampstead, 1852 to 55. Barbija School, 1830 to 1870. Let me begin with a painting. This Julius Dupre's painting called The River shows a grand tree. It's scalloped, outlined, silhouetted against a cobalt sky along the river bank. You see two miniature figures beneath the sheltering canopy of the tree, making the scale of the tree very rank. The lonely tree is the main subject here as it is in the center of the painting and shadows everything else. This painting was representative of the Barbija school, an informal group of artists including Jean Baptiste, Camel Coro, Nassis Virgil Diaz, De La Pena, Julius Dupre, Francois Louis Francois, Charles Emil Jacques, Jeans Francois Millet, Constant Troyan, and Theodore Rosso, who lived and worked around the small farming village of Barbija between 1830 to 1880. Rejecting the traditional artistic conventions of the academic landscape painting, such as the ideal, the pastoral, and the heroic, they strived instead to depict an unmediated version of nature, an approach that would prove central to later avant garde movements, such as Impressionism. The retreat to a pre-industrialized, unspoiled state of nature appealed not only to the painters of the Barbija school, but also immensely popular among the urban bourgeoisie who bought their paintings. Artists and patrons alike turned to nature, engaging it directly or through images as an antidote to the ills of modern industrialization. By the early 19th century, Paris was already transforming into a modern metropolis and went far away from traditional and rural ways of life. The modernization of Paris, including industrialization and Haussmannization, resulted in the creation of a dirty, crowded, inhuman and artificial environment. It was the opposite of natura, naturance, or natural nature. A medieval ideal revived during this period by, among others, the art critic Theophil Thor, a good friend and supporter of many of the Barbija painters. By mid-century, guided to the forest trails, had been published taking the hikers on the prescribed and safe route through the ancient trees. 
nature no longer existed in the city and had to be visited not only by weary city dwellers but also by photographers such as Charles Morville and Gosto Legree and by painters who sought a true and real nature not the rarefied nature of Pusa or Lorraine. As early as 1837, the painter Theodore Rousseau settled in village in order to paint pure landscapes, meaning landscapes without narrative or metaphysical figures. Although the members of the Barbija school shared no set doctrine or credo, and their styles varied significantly. They were united in their common desire to experience nature directly and to present it individualistically and poetically, employing painterly techniques that emphasize the subjectivity of the artist through effects of light and atmosphere. Through their poetic depictions of nature, the Barbija painters rejected the traditional artistic conventions of the academic landscape painting, such as the pastoral and the heroic, and strived instead to depict a less idealized, more personal version of a humble nature. If you look at the river once again, you will see that the pink and the mauve patches play a supporting role for the tree, which traditionally was too mundane, a subject to merit being anything but a study. Choosing a commonplace tree over spectacular sunrise was a conscious departure from, from such academic conventions. The French Rococo, 17th century Dutch landscapes and genre scenes and the more recent landscapes of English painters such as James W. Turner and John Constable are the major influences on the school. The school is of the view that role of the painting was not to inspire of for breathtaking beauty of nature as prescribed by the theory of contemplative sublime, but to engage the viewer in the quotidian serenity of nature. The place on the edge of the forest of Fontainebleau, once the hunting domain of French kings, lay the tiny village of Barbiza. It is spread across 42,000 acres of dense woods undercut with meadows, marshes, gorges, and sandy clearings. Bitterly cold winters and warm summers, coupled with heavy rainfall, encouraged the growth of a wide variety of tree specimens. A great attraction for incipient, incipient, a great attraction for incipient landscape painters. White hamlets ringed the forest, refuges for the wood choppers and modest farm laborers. The overage at Barbija provided lodging for painters who typically foraged into nearby forest in warm weather and retreated the Parisian studios in winter. After day-long excursions in the nature, artists convened at the Orberge Gane to share ideas, discuss technical practices, and reveal in one another's company. Barbija was more than just a place. It was an encompassing motif. Like other great motifs, it transcended geography. The artist of the Barbija school showed us the rapidly disappearing rural path to painterly truth. Well before the Impressionist trod the same forest and fields, carrying with them their factory-made statues with metallic tubes of new pigments and their modern ways of seeing. Landscape painting was no longer subservient 
to history painting. It was history in making. Plain air techniques. Perhaps the most fundamental aspect of Barbija practice important to the artist as well as their patrons was working a plain air is a French expression which means in the open air and is particularly used to describe the act of painting outdoors. We know that any painting goes through a process from the sketch to the final product. The impression was the first take, the original sketch, which was greatly valued by collectors in the Romantic period as evidence of each thoughts of the artist and of the authenticity of his genius. Previously, painters made their own paints by grinding and mixing their pigment powders with linseed oil. Being able to paint out of doors was due to the invention of the small portable easel and of portable paints in tubes. In 1836, a company blot offered the first machine ground colors for sale. The artists were now liberated from the studio. Not only did it provide an opportunity to observe light effects directly, but it appeared to promise an unmediated engagement with nature that would ensure the artistic independence of their illusion. To viewers also, a painting seemed to bring them one step closer to nature. The artist, the father of Barbija school, Theodore Roshu, was indeed possessed by the forest, a powerful voice for painting outdoors. He spent more time there than any of his fellow artists, often guiding them to his favorite haunts. He worked in the forest in all climates, even in the freeze of winter, and only returned to Paris to advance sales. He preferred such expressions of size and features of universe as wild trees, the blueness of skies, and the sunshine. Narcis Diaz de la Pena was his most loyal discipline. Together, they often packed a picnic to last the day. As they ventured into the woods in search of imagery, Dias was not of a temperament to paint the meticulous detail so familiar in Rosso's landscapes. Yet his heavily impastored canvases Nonetheless, won much praise at the Paris Salon. Millet moved his growing family to Fontainebleau to escape an epidemic of cholera that followed the revolution of 1848. He and his wife raised nine children in a spare pigeon cottage bordering the forest. Penurious circumstances never dampened Millie's spirit, nor did they compromise his productive career. All his life, he painted farm labors with blunt realism and quiet dignity. Camille Coro, perhaps the most influential of all the French landscape painters, of the 19th century never settled in fountain blow. Although its rocky outcroppings and majestic trees informed some of his prized early paintings, fountain blow, oak trees at the base brow, is one of the most vigorous and precise. Its sharply focused topography stands in contrast to his much later paintings. Willy de Avray, for example, in which nature dissolves 
in a silvery mist of tonal very season of the artist who joined coro in the french countryside in the summer months charles francois dobigny was the most accomplished dobigny worked in the forest of fontainebleau in his early years but his preference for water soon led him to other regions of france from his floating studio a refitted ferry called la botte the little box dobigny ambled along the river was painting transient skies and limpid waters his simple scenes of reflected light a river landscapes with storks for example resonate with the immediacy of the direct experience outdoor dobigny supported many impressionists in their early years and urged their inclusion in salon exhibition let us now look at the works from the school pre raphaelite brotherhood in 1848 as the revolution swept continental europe and uprising for social reform known as chartism unsettled britain seven rebellion young artists in london formed a secret society with the aim of creating a new british art the pre raphaelite brotherhood in short they were called prp was founded in 1849 by william holman hunt 1827 to 1910 dg rossetti john avery millet 1829 to 1896 william michael rossetti james collinson Thomas Wolner and F G Stephens to revitalize the arts this enchanted with contemporary academic painting most of them were colleagues at the royal academy of art and famously despised the academy's founding president sir joshua reynolds they were in opposition to the royal academy's promotion of the renaissance master profile this movement is called britain's first modern art movement as it combines rebellion beauty scientific precision and imaginative grandeur they emulated the art of late medieval and early renaissance europe until the time of raphael an art characterized by minute description of detail a luminous palette of bright colors that recalls the tempera paint used by the medieval artist and the subject matter of a noble religious or moralizing nature inspired by the theories of john ruskin who urged artists to go to nature they believed in an art of serious subjects treated with maximum realism they wanted to create an art of the modern age by the following of these works 
testing and defying all conventions of art. For example, if the Royal Academy schools taught art students to compose paintings with a pyramidal groupings of figures. B. One major source of light at one side meshed by a lesser one on the opposite. And C. An emphasis on rich shadow and tone at the expense of color. The PRB with brilliant perversity painted bright colored even lit pictures that appeared almost flat. The PRB also emphasized precise almost photographic representation of even humble objects, particularly those in the immediate foreground, which were traditionally left blurred or in shape, thus violating conventional views of both proper style and subject. Following Ruskin, they attempted to transform the resultant hard age realism created by one and two by combining it with typological symbolism. At their most successful, the PRB produced a magic or symbolic realism, often using devices found in the poetry of Tennyson and Browning. Believing that the arts were closely allied, the PRB encouraged artists and writers to practice each other's art. Though only D.G. Rossetti did so with particular success. Looking for new subjects, they drew upon Shakespeare, Keats and Tennyson. Their theme choice were very bold and daring. They painted problematic subjects such as poetry, immigration, prostitution, and the double standard of the sexual morality in society. To understand their pictures, one needed to read a lot and with acute concentration. All these paintings are so densely encoded with signs and symbols that you have to work hard at depicting them. Their painters self-consciously overturned orthodoxy and established a new benchmark for modern painting and design. Their paintings are characterized by the intensity of their bright, clean color and the highly detailed complexity of their delicate drawing. They had no forcefulness of brushwork or light and shade and the pigments were applied with a miniature-like precision. The figures have certain awkwardness about them, as the painters did not want to make conventional graces of pose and relied entirely on freshly observed natural gesture. They obviously suffered from heavy criticism, but became very influential soon after, leading to the second phase of the movement from about 1860. Inspired particularly by the work of Rossetti, making major contribution to symbolism. It was called aesthetic pre-Raphaelitism, producing the arts and crafts movement and modern functional design. After the impact of PRB was over, William Morris and Dante, Gabriel Rossetti, designing handcrafted household objects, signaling the beginning of the arts and crafts movement through their company called Morris and Company from 1861 onwards. Late Morris let more artists join in Edward Jones, Simon Solomon and Albert Moore and brought newer ideas and discussions leading to the subtle leading to the subtle merging of pre reflectism with what is now referred to as the aesthetic movement prevalent in the 1870s through 
the 1890s. This style reflected a desire to move away from the sentimental narratives of the early Victorian period and to focus instead on images of beauty, often women, in which color harmony, the beauty of form and compositional balance took precedence over narrative. Let us look at some of the best works here. William Holman Hunt, The Light of the World, 1851-53. Noted for detail, vivid color, elaborate symbolism, this painting is one of the best by Hunt. This painting is very high on religious symbolism. Look at Christ painted as a solid figure challenging notions of conventional notions of religious art. Christ's lantern is source of light in the painting, promises a new day, a new life. As he writes about the painting, the closed door was the obstinately shut by the weeds, the cumber of daily neglect, the accumulated hindrances of sloth, the orchard, the garden of delectable fruit for the dainty feast of the soul, the bait flitting about only in darkness was a natural symbol of endurance. The painter says that he was inspired by the explanation, the songs, Mille, Christ in the house of his parents, the carpenter's shop. The carpenter's shop was perhaps the finest religious picture in a period when such subjects were much point when such subjects were much painted, but seldom with the imaginative insight and creative power to raise them from the level of illustrations to independent works of art. It is painted with a it is painted with a direct levity and freshness of vision, which are unforgettable. And the stillness of the figures combined with the sharp realization of the whole scene produces an effect of truly religious awe. Look at the red-headed Jesus. He was criticized for having shown Jesus as a Jew, who cut his hand on an exposed nail, symbolic of the crucifixion. Look at the Saint Annie removing the nail with a pair of pincers as the parents watch. The young John the Baptist brings in water to wash the wound, prefiguring his later baptism of Christ. Mille Ophelia 1851-52 Shakespeare was one of the major influences on the PRB and his painting on Ophelia brings out the pregnancy of her madness and death. Look at the plants, forget me nots and the poppy symbolic of death here. Look at the very credible particulars of dress and setting. The model is the red-headed Elizabeth Sedal, famously posed in a bath of water heated by lamps, catching a terrible cold when they went out. Dante Gabriel Rossetti and his work The Blue Power, 1865. Rossetti was an English poet, illustrator, painter and translator and the most imaginative of all painters in the PRB. He painted beautiful women, sensuous half-length figures with luxurious wavy dresses and close range of exotic settings and emphasizes the female domination of men, often linking it with male destruction. Look at the Titian X red hair, vivid colors, along with the Japanese koto, the musical instrument, and Indian jewel neck piece. 
His symbolic use of Japanese and Oriental art makes him as a founder of the aesthetic movement in Britain and the precursor of European symbolism. Henry Wallace Chatterton, 1855 to 56. In this painting of the death of the society of the 17-year-old Thomas Chatterton, an English poet, there is a stark realism in the use of details of the room's furnishings and the poet's clothing. The horizontal canvas is used to communicate the tone-like feel. This is history, not with its virtues of victory and valor, but its pathos also seen in ripped of pieces of paper, a single shoe lying on the floor, and the fatal dose of medicine fallen away from the poet's hand adding to the story of troubled, misunderstood genius. Ford Maddox Brown, an English autumn afternoon in Hampstead, 1852 to 55. The PRB was committed to cap the PRB was committed to capturing truth in the landscape by laboriously transcribing every pinkle leaf and not change what they observe in nature. The painting here showcases the innovativeness of the theme. Yes, there is the young couple and the hovering dog, but all components of the composition have been gotten rid of, have been gotten rid of. No path or winding streams leads to the eye back to the distant vista. The view of a red roofed house is cut off randomly by the foreground and there is no central focal point.